Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And thank you for joining me today for part two of my interview with Jim Bruton. Part one is linked in the description where he shares about his near-death experience. And today we're going to do a Q&A. I will have all of Jim's links to his books and his website in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Here's Jim. So I wanted to come back to that statement you made that the only force of will you'll ever need is the art of letting go. That's, it seems like two opposing things, the force of will and the art of letting go. Yeah, it's as if sometimes it's like he's making a little bit of a joke, like saying you're standing in the impossible now. What's the impossible now? You know, it's impossible because it's impossibly short, but impossibly wide. It's across universes, right? Um, but that's as much, I think, because it, it was speaking to me in a way that I would appreciate and I would understand and even nuance some humor into it. Um, but yeah, but basically it's also saying all the force you need is no force at all, right? All the effort you need to make is no effort at all. Wow, that makes sense. Yeah. And so... I think with that, you know, just began my journey. I, I mean, I, I guess the it's fair to say that after a near-death experience, the next thing facing you is how to integrate it into your life. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you do now? And for me, remember, I was told pay attention to my relationships. So um, after a year, I was still able to just sit here and stare at the wall for six hours. No problem. And my wife at the time came in and said, we need to go to marriage therapy. <laughs> so we did for 18 yeah. months and it didn't really do any good. Um, though it was good that we put an effort, but it was it, it, an interesting statistic is that, or like you might say, normal people in the United States, there's a divorce rate of about 53%. So that already says the odds are somewhat against you. And for people who have near-death experiences, it's more like 78%, which is a 50% increase. And this is something I speak about a lot now because I don't think there's enough information or enough support out there for people, not only who are having near-death experiences, but for the spouses who did not have the near-death experience and feel a little lost or a little left in the dust. And so... It's easy to see how this can happen. I mean, like I said, 47% on a good day are able to keep it together while the 53% not. Now you throw this uh, randomizer in like a near-death experience and you're looking at this person who sounds like they did yesterday. They look like they did yesterday, but it's not the same person. Your values have changed. Everything has changed. Your shared hopes, dreams, even your shared prejudices have changed. Uh, you've become maybe less religious, but certainly more spiritual. And that brings a certain ambiguity into the relationship of its own. And there are not too many relationships that welcome any kind of ambiguity. People generally want to know where they stand and where you stand. But that's that's part of the challenge is spirituality itself is a very ambiguous subject. We can talk about all the blacks and whites of good and evil, but then we really start to learn that maybe there are no good people and no bad people. They're just overwhelmed people who are making good and bad choices. Um, they're not their choices, but they, they may, they're they capable of making mistakes and they're capable of making great decisions. Um, but they're none of those things. They're just, it, they're just a single moment in time in terms of how we measure them, but it's not the complete picture. So anyway, like I said, that just kind of kept rolling through my mind. So that's something I talk about a lot these days is uh, the impact on relationships and the self and how to not necessarily how to navigate it, because I'm not going to be someone who stands up there and makes huge declarative statements that ends all conversation. I'm more likely to phrase it as a question, questions that just provoke thought, because if you ask a question, people can fill it in the best they can with their own experience or their own intuition. And that's where we start, you know, just giving people the answer. They're not going to value it very much. And it's not their answer. It needs to be their answer. So I think as we focus on these sometimes somewhat ambiguous truths that resonate with us, that ring true, but we may not be fully there yet, 
as we keep them in mind, as we live our life from day to day, they become a filter through which we see life and, and see experience. And then we start to be able to phrase what we see and phrase what we feel in those terms. And we start to fill in those gaps. And one day we have this, we don't answer the question. We awaken to the question, have this aha moment. And we're able to now restate that truth in our own words with our own authenticity that before then may well have been counterfeit. Jim, do you mind if I ask you a few more questions about your experience? Go right ahead. Okay. Do you have some sense of who the voice was that was speaking to you? Yeah, it certainly knew more than me. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, everybody, I mean, not everybody, a lot of people want to hear you say it was God, or they certainly, a lot of people want you to say it was Jesus. Like every third word in your dialogue has to be Jesus, or it wasn't from God, you know, it's like, but I don't think it required him identifying himself as anything other than the truth. And it was truth. And, and here's the thing. It needed to be a truth that resonated with me. It didn't need to be a truth that resonated simply because this entity said, I am God or I am Jesus. That's a horrible reason for you to say that truth resonates for you. I don't think that's what God wants. I think that's what free will is all about. And that's why it was given to us that we see our truth and we hear our truth in as unfiltered a manner as possible. And if we choose to do the right thing, we choose to do the right thing, not because God told us to, or Jesus told us to, or Buddha or Muhammad, but because it simply felt right to do the right thing. It's like solving a complex math problem and you solve it for what is right. And solving it for what is right usually incorporates a certain amount of selflessness, not ego, not self-service, but our life in service to others. So, and I think the divine God, I do think God really enjoys us going through that sense of discovery on our own. Just like if we give a child a puzzle, we don't solve the puzzle for them. We watch them solve the puzzle and we delight in seeing how their mind works in solving that puzzle and putting the toy together or dressing their doll or building a tree house or whatever it is they do. We want to know them through the experience of their discovery. And I think it's the same thing here. So it could have, you know, it could have been a more evolved version of myself. But if you really get metaphysical about it, you know, we're already considered to be, you're already one with God. You just you talk to the version you can understand and communicate with. Um, so if you're already one with God, little does it matter whether it's an advanced version of yourself or whether it's the highest level of God. The fact is, God comes down and speaks to us on our own level. You know, the, the model it used that is somewhat mechanical is suited to me because, you know, I've, I've built things, you know, I built airplanes. So obviously I understand gears and mechanisms and things like that. I think it was poetic how it was housed in an egg and then says, this is the future birthing into the now. Well, that made nice sense. I love that answer, Jim. So do you remember any of the choices that you took out? No. And I was told it wasn't important. Like I said, I remember two that I left in one of them has come to pass. It was an odd one. It was it was a very, I mean, it was a nice one. So it's not like it had a great moment. It was just a moment. Uh, but the other one uh, has yet to come to pass. And that's the one with the grandchildren at the amusement park. Um, but I definitely was given a, a sense of, in, in waiting and anticipation, if you will, for future probabilities to emerge, there, there's an increased instinct in knowing which ones will and which ones won't. And it's not, and so what's nice is it removes the need to do anything to make these good or, or favorable probabilities emerge. It's more just the very slight guidance. It might be a word here or a nudge there. But very little interaction is needed to sort of guide the process into expression. And then it's it's the right fit. And you're and the thing is you're already anticipating it. So you're ready for it. At one point the voice said to you that no one deserves salvation. Could I ask you what 
what was meant by salvation? What do we need salvation from? Well, I think, again, because it just referred to the chains of the world. You know, when you make bad choices, you have to cr carry the crushing weight of those chains once they're forged around you. We'll take a look out the window. How many people do you see carrying those chains? Salvation is freedom from carrying chains. Salvation ultimately is pointing in the direction of less attachment to this world. You know, this is not our true home. We're all just passing through. As an example, if you want to continue in the tradition of Christianity, you know, at one point, you know, Judas was a zealot. And the zealots had this military idea of what the coming Messiah would be. Like they thought Jesus was going to come and be a general and throw the Romans out. And, you know, if you lived under the Romans, that'd probably be a very natural <laughs> prophecy to want to believe in. And Judas said to Jesus one day, said, uh, okay, so you can, you know, like, raise the dead, heal the blind, feed the hungry. What's a little thing like kicking out the Romans? And Jesus literally said, you know, this world's always been crap and it's always going to be crap. I didn't come here to fix the world. I came here to fix you, including the Romans. And look what happened 352 later, uh, years later with the first Nicene Conference in which the Roman Empire adopted Christianity. Oh, wow. I never thought about that. There it is. So that that's, that speaks to the nature of the world and what salvation means. You know, you can't row in two boats at once. You have to choose. And that choice is one you make every single moment. Just like this universe, it only exists because God wills it into existence every single moment. What does it mean that right and wrong are variables outside of our control? Yeah. Okay. If most people would define, well, most people it, it sort of quickly might define right and wrong as defined by law, right? You know, like, don't beat your wife, don't beat your kids, don't beat people up, at, you know, because the coffee line is too long. But I'll give you an example. Sometimes right and wrong is no more than the whimsy of a politician's pen. If you don't believe me, just talk to anyone who was engaged in the Underground Railroad during the Civil War freeing slaves from the South and bringing them up to the North. They were absolutely traitorous criminals to right. the Confederacy. And yet, would we say they were wrong today? So let's just use that as our example. So that's why I say, and, and I've definitely seen God bend the rules I have. And it's kind of interesting to see it. And it's interesting to be in the middle of it when it's happening but again, it's not for any reason like, oh, I got to speed and I didn't get caught because I had to get to my hot date. It's nothing stupid like that. It's just how it's just interesting how the timing can sometimes be accelerated or be delayed or someone can be distracted or someone can decide to be kind. Uh, it's interesting to see how reality bends and how synchronicities may even increase as a result of, I think, reharmonizing with the way we're intended to live. And to me, that's what an NDE is. It's like rebooting your computer. Mm. Yeah, I now agree with that. Now you're version 2.0. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to read a quote that I heard you say in another interview that really struck me. Sure. You said, by approaching a state where we're not collapsing our probabilities into a singular point of present reality, we are becoming the light. Mm. What does that mean? Could you explain that to me? Yeah, what I'm speaking to there is this. We live, okay, let me start it this way. You know how one, once COVID kicked in about almost two and a half years ago, you know, this was also timed with the presidential election. This was timed with so many of the social justice issues going on, whether it was Black Lives Matter, Me Too, um, heaven knows what else. And, and then, of course, you know, how are we handling migration? Everything was a rage. Everything was dialed up 11 out of 10. Everyone was screaming and no one was communicating. It was just and it was just hitting us on social media every day. And then it really boiled down to who's vaccinated and who's not and which, which camp are you in and how is that going to get politicized? So everyone was almost by default being forced into this binary way of thinking. It's us or them. 
it's vaccinated or unvaccinated, rich or poor, black or white, male or female, blah, blah, blah. But it was the word or was between the two camps. And part of living in that incredibly polarized environment that is very binary is it forces you to say something is this or it's that. And yet, between the polarities of this and that, the polarities of right and wrong or or you know, male, female, rich or poor, there is a tremendous amount of shades of gray between the two. And the shades of gray are really where we find each other. They're where we start to understand compromise. Because when you're in those binary camps, it's my way or the highway, right? There's only one way and it's my way and everybody else is going to burn in hell, okay? Whereas those shades of gray have more tolerance. There's more opportunity for love. There's more opportunity for understanding. And this is, like I say, is where we actually discover each other. And this is where the truth lies. Not in the right or in the wrong, but in the in-between. Okay. So part of seeing... As I meant, you, you know, was referencing in quantum physics, the superposition, superposition probabilities just means a bunch of options are stocked, stacked on top of each other at any given moment in time. You can go left or right, up or down, or choose to do something or not do something. But at each moment, you generally make a choice. But what I was saying is if you wait to the last possible minute and don't try to force anything, don't try to force a choice, as much as you can just let things unfold naturally, to just be in a receptive state of waiting, then this is preferable. And so live a type of life in which you don't have to force choices. Live a type of life in which the choices that naturally unfold are good choices. Because, you know, like, like I've said before, you know, when, when somebody does something really bad in, in, you know, it's in the newspaper or in the news, a lot of people will say, you know, that's, that's Satan, you know, whatever. They're blaming Satan. I'm like, Satan didn't do anything. Satan might, or the negative power, might present you with choices. But no one is sitting on you and putting a funnel down your mouth and put, pouring something down it. That is not happening. We make those choices. It's us that we need to blame. You want to find who to blame? Look at the mirror. And so that's why I say the that art of letting go is where you live the type of life that the things that naturally tend to eventuate are good things. And then you don't have to force anything. And this is moving toward the light. Thank you so much for explaining that, Jim. And thank you for sharing your near-death experience and everything else that you've shared with us today. Is there anything else that you would like to say about your books or about where people can find you? Well, uh, the books are on Amazon. Like I said, um, the in between a trip of a lifetime, followed by the practice in between the art of letting go. And if you go, uh, I believe you mentioned it at the beginning, um, in between productions, that's with an S dot com, uh, you'll see the narrative of my near death experience, as well as a couple of places you can click to go to Amazon for the books. I am not concerned about selling books. I'm not, believe me, nobody's doing this for the money. Um, but it you might you might find it interesting it might resonate with you if anyone has any questions if they go to that website they'll see a contact link and they could click on it and ask me anything they want all right i'll have all of those links in the description thank you so much for being willing to have this conversation with me today jim thank you melissa and thank you to those who've joined us today 